May I request Shri Sharat Sagar to deliver the convocation address. Sir. You all look so good today. Give yourselves a round of applause. I'm just doing my mic check. <laughs> Wonderful. This is my second time in your beautiful city. And the last time I was here, I had the great honor of meeting Madam Amin. And I was speaking at the Ramakrishna Mission here in Baroda. And I started my speech with the words Madam Amin and it crossed a million views on the internet. So, so today I'm very decided. I'm going to start the speech with Madam Amin and not President Amin. So here we go. Uh, Madam Amin, President Rahul Aminji, Provost Malik, members of the board, members of the faculty, friends and alumni of the university, proud parents, and of course you the graduating class of this great university. A very good evening to each one of you. It's an incredible honor for me to be standing here and speaking to you, to be here as your chief guest and to deliver the convocation address. Because, and I'm super nervous, because I was told that I'm your fifth convocation speaker ever and the nation's youngest and just look at the lineup. In the past years, you had a member of the House of Lords. Then you had one of India's highest civilian awardees. You had CEOs of the nation's largest corporations. And now you have me. A small boy born and brought up in small towns and villages of Bihar. And standing in front of you right now. But then that's the kind of country that you're graduating college in. It is the only country in the world where a young boy from the coast of Rameshwaram can go on to be the missile man of this country. And even the most beloved president. It is the only country in the world where the son of a Kolkata attorney can go on to make a speech at the World Parliament of Religions in Chicago that would shape the world and shake it even 125 years later. It is the only country in the world where mothers who could not read or write groomed the greatest scholars and fathers who could never cross a state border or the national shores themselves educated their kids at the greatest institutions in different states and not just that, even overseas. It is the only country in the world where language and culture and tradition changes every few kilometers. But we all sing the same beautiful national anthem, pledge our allegiance to the same proud flag, and show our patriotism in our own unique ways, in our own languages. We pray for the betterment of this country in our own places of worship. Our prayers may look different, but our hopes are the same. We enjoy and celebrate sports and music and food in our own unique ways, but at the end of the day, it all comes together to be truly Indian. So if there's one thing I want to tell you, even before I begin my convocation address, that you were born and you graduated college in a country where all good things are possible. And my standing here is one that tells you that story, and the history of this country tells you that story. Be it the story of President Kalam or Swami Vivekanand, be it the story that we witness in our homes every single day when our mothers who may not have received doctorates themselves create the finest PhD scholars. I'm pretty sure there are so many of you who are sitting in the audience today that you know that your father did not have this degree or your mother did not have this degree and you would not have had this degree had it not been for them. So give them a round of applause. So, if I was to tell you a little bit about myself, I was born in a small village of Bihar, in a place called Zirade, some eight kilometers away from where the first president of India was born, Dr. Rajendra Prashad. 
my parents decided to name me Sharad because I was born in this season. It was the winter season. They decided to name me Vivek after the great patriot monk who I just talked about, Swami Vivekananda. And they named me Sagar after a great Indian feminist and a champion for everybody's education and social reform, Ishwar Chand Vidya Sagar. One who championed female education in this country, one who championed several social reforms and even got the Widow Remarriage Act passed by the British. So my parents were not very rich or very extremely well educated, but they had a vision for the future. They named me Sharad Vivek Sagar because they thought that I would come together as a Sharad who would be an ocean of wisdom. They were not educated in some of the finest institutions of the world, but they dared to put together all that they had and pour it in us, me and my two siblings. And the three of us were homeschooled for the longest period of time. My brother first went to school in Standard 8, my sister first went to school in Standard 7th. I first went to school in Standard 4th. Now this was not because we were having a lot of fun at home. This was because we were being raised in small towns and villages where there were no good schools. So we would be taught at home. Our greatest companions were the quotes and words of wisdom of people as President Kalam and Swami Vivekananda. Where, while we were growing up, we were told that small aim is a crime and we were told that all good things are possible. So we worked hard. My brother went to MIT Boston on a full scholarship. Sister went to Columbia on a full scholarship. I went to Tufts on a full scholarship. And it was a lot of fun. <laughs> While I was in school, between Standard 4th and Standard 12th, I competed in almost everything that came my way. So. I would compete in quiz competitions and debate competitions. I would just put my name in for any scholarship exam or any conference that was going to take place. And between Standard 4th and Standard 12th, I had the great honor of representing this great nation in over six different countries. Represent India at, on UN boards and continue to engage at every single platform and see quite a bit of success as a high school student. But it reminded me why I was doing what I was doing. And the answer was very clear. When I was being homeschooled in small towns and villages of Bihar, my daily habit was to read the newspaper. And the moment I would hear a good story, read a good story about any student who had achieved something, gone to a great university or won a big competition, bagged a big scholarship or spoke at a recent conference, I would just write down their names and the competitions that they went to. When I first went to school, I took out this diary where all these opportunities were, were listed already. So I started participating in these competitions and won at a number of those. And it reminded me that when I was in school, my story was my story because of my upbringing. I knew that these opportunities existed, so I won at all these competitions. My friends didn't know about these opportunities. So while I was still in high school, I founded an organization called Dexterity Global with the idea to extend the same opportunities to other young people around me so that we could hone future leaders. Because it was clear to me that it is not just hard work that takes you from A to B. You need to know what opportunities are there for you. And I know it is as relevant for the young middle school and high school students that I work with as it is for you as you graduate from college and enter your new workplace or as you move forward in your journey. You'll work hard, but a number of times you'll need to be super aware of the opportunities that are around you. So overall, if you really look at it, I had a diverse upbringing overall, from being in small towns and villages of Bihar to being educated in the intellectual capital of the world, literally, in the great city of Boston, where once I graduated, I had the great honor of being the first Indian to deliver the graduation address at my university in 160 years. And that probably makes me uh, one of the fastest people to go from the graduation address to the convocation address. So that is good, but let's talk about what's more important here. When I graduated college, I received an offer to go to Harvard for a master's degree, but I'd spent four years time 
working between two time zones, managing a full-fledged team here on ground in India and continuing to work towards my degree in the US. So I decided to turn down the offer and return to India. When I was in college, everybody would ask me that you received this big scholarship worth several crores to come to college here. What will you do once you graduate? And I would always tell them that on the night of graduation, I'll take the first flight back home. So in the morning, I delivered the graduation address. And in the evening, while everybody else was partying, I hope some of you do that tonight, but as everybody else was partying, I took the first flight back home to India and went back to where I came from, the state of Bihar. So overall, in this short, limited experience that I have, I don't have many things to share with you. But I decided I'll not make this convocation address too long or too preachy. So I'm not going to quote you Buddha and Gandhi and everybody. And I'm not going to tell you very high level stuff. So do not expect it from me. But there are two to three simple things that I want to talk to you about. And nothing that I'll say today in this convocation address would be something that I do not deeply feel or haven't already felt in my life. So the first thing that I want to leave you with in your convocation today is the harsh reality. A lot of times when you are a college student, life is so beautiful, so wonderful. You study in your classes and you go to the canteen, you have some of your finest friends and you live some of the best times of your life. And everybody tells you that once you graduate, you graduate in the real world. Everybody will treat you with respect. You have a great degree and you'll be doing good things. I want to tell you the same thing, but I want to add something else. I want to let you know that a number of times in life, life will punch you in the face. And it will actually literally punch you in the face. Do not be bothered by that. The day I received this convocation address, invitation to come here and speak to you. To my left was my ailing brother who had been my personal hero throughout my life, who, as I mentioned, went to school for the first time in Standard 8. And by the time he was in Standard 12, he was already working with NASA as a student astronaut on the Red Rover Goes to Mars project, when they landed Spirit and, Spirit and Opportunity on Mars. So I was a small kid, and I was seeing this older brother doing so well. So no matter how smart I was, I always knew that there was somebody who was so much smarter than me. When he reached standard 12th, he received a full scholarship to go to MIT Boston, the world's greatest institute of engineering. So he went to MIT, got a degree, and did incredible things there. Was invited by consecutive US presidents. His research was widely quoted by noted professors, US Department of Defense, and all these great organizations. And the day I received the invite to come here and be your convocation speaker, he was ailing with a TB infection, one that had spread remarkably quick from his lungs to his abdomen, and it was very late when doctors had diagnosed it. I didn't know what to say or what to do, but I realized that when something is in front of you, you just do it. So I told my brother that I've been invited, and I wrote back to Madam Amin saying, I'd be proud to join you in this true moment of Navrachna, when you move from this life to the real life. Only one month ago, that is barely a month and three days ago, I lost my brother. After some 17 days in an intensive care unit, uh, he passed away. And everybody asked me if I would cancel this convocation address if I would postpone it, if I would show up. But five days later, after he passed away, I was back in the villages of North Bihar, working with small kids who looked the same, who represented the same ideas and ideals, who had the same dreams and who came exactly from where I came or my sister came or my brother came. And I knew one thing for sure, that you honor the legacy of somebody who had been a true karma yogi throughout his life somebody who was dedicated to science and to space and to society. You truly honor their legacy by continuing to do your work. 
So five days after my brother's loss, I was in the villages of North Bihar, meeting with kids, talking to them, interacting, engaging. And there was one simple reason why I was, I was doing it. And it was to honor his legacy, to continue the work, and to continue following the philosophy that I had learned looking at him and what he would tell me all the time. And that's the first message, message that I want to leave you with. And that is that life will punch you in the face a lot of times. It's you who's got to dust yourself, get back up, and punch it back in the face. I hope you'll do that, Arashna. You'll be in good offices, and you may be a female employee who may not get along with a male employee really well. Don't go home and cry. Confront that person. You may be a male employee who is not getting a promotion that you think, you expect, and you deserve. If that doesn't happen, put a letter asking for an explanation and put a letter that says that you're resigning. The next time you find that there are problems in this country and you feel like you're being punched in the face, just dust yourself, get back up and punch it back in the face. That's who I want you to go forward to be, if at all there's one thing that I can tell you. The second thing I want to let you know comes from my personal experience. Next year, the organization that I founded as a high school student would turn 10, Dexterity Global. We set out to groom next century leaders because we felt it wasn't enough to call our politicians leaders when sometimes they could not even behave like one. We felt that we needed leaders in the field of business, in the field of medicine, in the field of engineering and healthcare, in all other avenues that are not even considered leadership what President Amin is doing, or what Madam Amin is doing, what your faculty and what all the board members are doing is leadership. What a friend of yours who might just have picked a plate left at a canteen table did was leadership. What you do when you help a, an old woman cross the road is leadership. When you stand up for somebody, or when you do right things, when you have the right values and you know your heart is in the right place, all of that is leadership. So some 10 years ago, we set out to groom leaders. But we realized we need to connect them with every single opportunity. So we connect around 5.5 million kids in this country alone with opportunities on the first of every month and the 15th of every month, right there in their own homes and schools. At Dexterity, I have had the honor of meeting some remarkable young people. So we connect kids with opportunities, we help them build their skill sets, we help them write their applications to some of the fi finest colleges in the world. When I say write their applications, I mean not the lines that they will write, but at least letting them know what the timelines look like, what the deadlines are like. Can they get a scholarship to go to a university as great as Harvard? Those are questions we asked ourselves when we got to this cause. Because we felt that to shape this nation, you need to shape a young generation. So the next two messages that I have for you come from the young people who I've worked with. So five days after my brother's loss, as I was talking to you about, I was in the villages of North Bihar, in a small village by the name of Sayedpur. Sayedpur received its first electricity pole that would give continuous electricity, electricity supply to the villagers of Sayedpur only five years ago. But five years ago, something else happened in that small village. A young boy, a proud DEC school graduate, on a 2G mobile phone, decided to start a Facebook page where he felt that it wasn't cool that people called out Biharis on every single platform. So as a young 11 or 12 years old, he started on a 2G mobile phone, a Facebook page that would collect positive stories of Bihar from all over the internet and just keep posting it on the page. He called it Apna Bihar, brought together a few people, and just kept doing it. In the next five years, powered by a tech school education, powered by his own ideas and dreams and idealism, this kid runs one of the largest social media portals, web and social media, that reaches around six to seven million people every single week, and it's called Apna Bihar. So any of you sitting right here, if you feel you're too small to make change happen, I want you to be reminded of that young kid from Sayedpur, who at my first call said that he would be very happy to welcome me in Sayedpur. 
and introduced me to hundreds and thousands of young people like him. And I've got news for you. If you hear the 9 p.m. primetime shout out games and feel skeptic about the kind of nation we are building, I've got news for you. And that is that when I went to Saidpur, I found almost every single kid who had the potential to do the very same things. I found none of them any different from what me or my brother or my sister looked when we were on our study tables, when we were growing up in that kind of a humble background. These kids reminded me of the very same promise that this nation makes to every single child who's born in this country, simply because how our founding fathers shaped this nation, a room for disagreement, a place for your own ways of patriotism, and a promise in a democracy that whatever you set your minds and your heart to, you can achieve it. That nobody who has a little more money can stop you. Nobody who comes from a better or more powerful lobby can just hinder you. Or nobody who has never done things himself or herself can tell you, you cannot do it. So you'll go from here to many other workplaces. And many of you will start your own companies and do amazing things. If anybody tells you that you're only 21 or 24 or 25, whatever it is, and you're too small to make change happen, I want you to be reminded of that story. The story of a young boy starting on a 2G mobile phone in 2012 and running one of the most successful media portals of a state that literally has media houses that are funded by industrialists. This is the story of this country. I want to add to that this question that a lot of people ask that if you groom leaders, how do you take responsibility that all these leaders will actually have their heart in the right place? That once they get the opportunity and once they go to top colleges in this country or abroad, will they ever come back? Will they ever engage? Will the meaning of seva continue to be what it is? And I want to tell you that I have this really young chief of staff who works with me. Madam Amin and her team had the opportunity to deal with this young guy who works as my chief of staff. Studies on a full scholarship at a top school in the United States, splits his time across two time, jo time zones and continues to work hard every day. We talk about, in the words of the scripture, in the words of the holy books, Nishkam Karm. When, you, when I look at that young kid and I look at his dedication because he came to a dexterity platform as an 11 year old graduated from dexterity platforms. He was so smart that I said, will you work with me? And he said it would be an honor, so he just got started. Then he got a full scholarship to go to college, so I said, drop the plan, now you just focus on your degree. He said, if you could run in two time zones, I can run, run in two time zones as well. So I said, sure, go ahead. On one of his birthdays, his sister told me that we need a birthday gift. I said, what would it be? The sister said that on his birthday, if he spends one hour at home, that will be a good idea. Else all the time you guys are working with kids or you are in your office, you are discussing your ideas, debating different platforms. So send him home for an hour. I was like, is, is it your birthday today? So he said, yes. Like at least put it on social media. Now everybody knows when your birthdays are. So these are two young kids, some 11, 12 year old when they started some 17, 18 year olds right now. And if I could not think of a better example to give you when I wanted to talk about Nishkam Karm that I want and hope that all of you will take up. And when I wanted to tell you that no matter how young you are, you just get started. So I hope that these two messages are powerful enough for you to go ahead and change the world in your own unique, meaning, meaningful ways. The first, that be ready that life will punch you in the face. But dust yourself, get back up, and punch it back. And the second thing, that you're never too young, never too small to make change happen. But I want to add a word of caution before I leave you today. And that is that a lot of times in your life, you will feel powerless. You'll feel, what can I do about this situation? The people who you are up against are too powerful. The task ahead of you is too huge and the skills that you need are probably ones that you can never acquire. In these moments, I want to quote you a very short story from my own life. When I moved to Patna, I continued my daily habit, one that I have left recently. That was reading newspapers every single morning. 
as some 12 year old or 13 year old I guess I read this news story about a renowned Patna doctor who on the night of Diwali had a few people visit his house and complained to him that they had an ailing patient so this gentleman was on the dinner table an eight-year-old girl another one 14 a wife and this doctor he left the dinner table immediately because that is what he signed up for as a doctor you are 24 into 7 duty and nobody knew it better than this doctor so he left his dinner table and rushed to his clinic that was on the ground floor when he went to the ground floor these people who were pretending to be patients shot several bullets and he died on spot I read it in the newspaper next morning this entire story mentioned and the only thing I could relate to in this story was one the kind of world we live in where anything can happen at any moment where your security is not just your responsibility sometimes it is you you are on your own it is your only responsibility sometimes so I read this newspaper I could connect to the sad things that happen in the world but there was this other thing that I could connect to this doctor was survived by a daughter who was older than me and a daughter that was who was younger than me and I wondered if I could do anything about it I didn't even say this to my parents because they'd be like have you finished your homework for the day so this hurt me and this is not just the only story it is just one worth sharing so I'm sharing it with you I felt powerless I felt belittled in one moment I knew that I could do nothing about it and there'll be a lot of moments in your life when you would know that but several years later last year we had a young girl from the state of Bihar go to a top university in the US on a quarter million dollars in scholarship when she came to our office I was just discussing with her I was like what's your journey being like this is going to be a great opportunity for you the next four years are going to be one hell of an experience what do your parents do where do you come from because I tend not to know those things so she told me that her mother was a doctor her father was a doctor as well but he was no more it turns out it was that eight-year-old girl who in the worst of situations decided not to give up hope who had every reason to feel that life had been put to an end who had no role models for that matter sometimes and who had every reason to be somebody who would not do the homework because she didn't feel like who had every opportunity to say that she felt lonely and that she had her own excuses or complaints and her excuses by the way are very real but she chose not to do that and she chose to continue to fight hard gain a world-class education for herself and keep moving forward now Rachna tonight on this historic night for yourself as well because you'll do many things in life but you'll never graduate from college one more time with the degree that you're getting right now I want you to be reminded of the story of these young people one who builds out a media startup on a 2G phone one who goes to a great university on a full scholarship and still works across two time zones one who does not let even the losing of a father to violence be an excuse or be something that would weaken her then my question to you is what's your excuse now Rachna? tonight if you have to ask yourself one question no matter what kind of machines you are in front of whether it is the corporate machine of this country or the political machine whether these are the PR lobbies or just the powerful I don't get it what our excuse can be yes we'll be punched in the face a number of times and yes a lot of times we will feel small we will feel way too young to get something started and a lot of times we will know that we are powerless but if these three young kids can go ahead and do things that are so historic and so beautiful in nature because I know that these kids are going down this country's great history one day they may be 18 and 19 and 20 right now but 40 years down the line and 50 years down the line their stories will be movies and their movies will change lives here sitting right here with all that we could have possibly asked for we cannot make excuses we've been grateful that we've been gifted the kind of opportunities that we have a healthy body a healthy mind 
and a few opportunities and the great honor of being born in this country put together, these things are enough. So my final message to you is that India needs you. It needs young people who will not watch TV shows to find which anchor shouts more, who will not watch cricket matches just because one couple looks great, who will not be left in cinepolis and PVRs in this country. That when you watch a movie, you get super emotional. And when you go back, you say that it was one hell of a time. It was a lot of fun. It needs young people who do not talk about its politics as, oh, we do not have any other leader. It needs young people who, when they look at the corporate ladder, do not praise just the people who are there, but who ask the honest question that why in an independent India, 70 years after our independence, a woman in this country has to work 117 days extra to earn the same salary that a gentleman would. Why 70 years after our independence, there are few women who are in the board of governors and the board of trustees and on corporate boards in this country? Why even 70 years after our independence, our fight is still that there are so many people who die out of poverty and hunger, and there are so many people who die outside government health care facilities, and so many who get billed 700% extra at private health care facilities. I do not have all the answers, and I do not have all the solutions. So I took up to what I do today, work with the next generation of leaders, hopefully engage them in powerful, powerful pursuits, help them secure a good education, and hope that in the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or even within a century, we can see an India that breathes differently, not the Delhi air. An India that talks differently, not the prime time language. An India that hopes differently, not the political speeches. And an India that grows differently, not just the top 1%. So I hope So I hope that while you came here today to have a good time, to celebrate with your friends and family, and to really congratulate yourself for what you have achieved today. I want to remind you now, Rachna, that there are so many more things that we need to achieve. There's so much more that we need to do. I know that your parents sent you to college so that you make the family proud. But I know secretly every mother in this country wishes that you make this country proud. And remember, when you do that, I see myself as a Cargill child because I was barely seven or eight years old when Cargill happened. I had learned the speech that Prime Minister Vajpayee gave by heart. Every evening, when I would see on the television that soldiers would come back draped in the national flag, I would ask my mother, that what do you have to do in order to be draped in the national flag? She would tell me you would have to do a national duty. And I would always ask her, that, can I do the national duty? Would you be all right with that? And she would always, with a teary eye, she would say that, yeah, I would be proud of you. She passed away while I was still in high school. So yes, life does throw punches at you. But on her hospital bed, she would tell the nurses all the time, because at that point I had to go to South Korea to represent India at a UN conference. She would tell the nurses all the time that she had to buy a sports, a sports shoe for me, because I had to go to South Korea and they had some outdoor activity planned. But my mother had great plans for me, and I'm sure your mothers do too. My parents had great vision for me, and I know your parents do too. So this graduation, this convocation, going to good universities, getting good paychecks, walking good workplaces is not enough. We need to make that larger call our call. We need to answer that larger call to duty. And that is that in times when so many young people cannot afford to have two square meals a day, so many young people cannot afford to go to a good school or to a good college. Where so many young people are possibly working at sweatshops and restaurants right now as we sit down under this proud sky in this great country. At that point in time, we went to a college. We have a college degree. The question I want to leave you with is, what will you do with your college degree? Because it is not a question that I ask you. Some 50 years, 60 years down the line, your children, and yes, your grandchildren will ask you, 
that in 2017, when a nation was ailing, you had a university education. What did you do with it? So I end my speech, which is not necessarily a speech. It is just a request to each one of you and to anybody, anyone you can strike a good conversation with. It is a small request with you that ask yourself that in times when so many craved for so much, you had everything you could have possibly asked for. A proud set of parents, good dreams, great vision, vision, and an excessively loving, forgiving country. What will you do for all of them? That's my question to you tonight, Navrachna. Thank you so much. God bless you and God bless this republic. Thank you.